Welcome to Party Street. Today we are going to discuss about the enclosure in England. By the end of the 16th century, the price of foodstuffs had tripled and the cost of living mounted daily. Landlords suffered at first because they could not increase their rents to keep pace with the price rise. But as soon as leases expired, many landlords hastened to take their share of the profits either by farming land directly or by putting up rents demanding a large payment for the granting of a lease. Because land was in short supply, there was no shortage of bidders and generally speaking rents kept pace with prices and occasionally outstripped them. Big tenant farmers who were growing for the market and could put their prices could afford to pay high rents, but not the smaller men. peasant cultivators who had taken stability for granted and assumed that the value of money was as unchanging as the pattern of the season many were evicted from their holdings or else accepted a rent that was beyond their capacity to pay and lived in poverty Not surprisingly they hated the landlords and rack renting and increased payments or grasms for entering upon tenancies drove many of them to join revolts such as pilgrimage of grace and kits rebellion Hugh Latimer, who became Bishop of Orchester in 1535, made himself the spokesman of these small men and bitterly attacked the landlords. Rack-renting and extortionate grasms were very real evils, but many landowners were threatened with a decline in their living standards unless they enclosed all or part of their estates in order to farm more efficiently. A great deal of enclosure, either arable strip in the open fields or of communal pasture land, had already taken place by 1500 much of it by agreement the grievance came when agreement was impossible and the landlord acted alone evicting tenants at will and buying out freeholds There was no obvious alternative works for these men since industry was only slowly expanding and the demand for manufactured products was bound to be small at a period when the majority of the people spent the greater part of their income on rent and food. The evicted men took to the roads and became one of the major problems of the day. R. H. Tony wrote in his work titled The Agrarian Problem in the 16th Century that the 16th century lives in terror of the Trump. The first half of the century in particular was a time of increasing demand for wool and throughout a rising population provided more mouths for mutton. Sheep were easy to keep and to feed on England's extensive grasslands. They required little labor since one shepherd, his boy and his dog could look after a whole flock and they yielded immense returns. G. R. Elton explained the matter very wisely. According to him, there was therefore an increase of sheep farming even if the contemporary picture in Sir Thomas More's graphic but unreliable phrase of the sheep devouring the men must not be accepted too readily. But many men turned from an unprofitable arable economy to pasture in the 
earlier part of the century with the result that some villages quite disappeared and in East Anglia the demands of the local textile industries even called forth a type of grazier who owning no land ran his flocks on commons and waste ground. England has a good deal of land unsuitable for extensive and intensive arable farming but admirably suited for the sheep. A gentry and yeomanry desperate for an increased income to set off increased costs turned naturally to this way out, sometimes with bad effects on rural economy but by and large to the increase of the national wealth. There is really no evidence that the rising population went without food except in years of bad harvests, though the fear that more sheep farming would destroy food supply was ever present to Tudor statesmen. Throughout the century, England tended to export both grain and meat. In the present state of knowledge, it looks as though the increase of pasture farming started about the middle of the 15th century continued steadily to peak in the years 1540 to 1555 and then declined in part because the sheep had conquered because about as much land as they could and in part because the bottom dropped out of the wool market. There are Signs of more sheep were reared for mutton in Elizabeth's reign than the Henry VIII's. On the land from which tenants had been evicted sheep or cattle would be set off graze, for these faced a high price and cost little in labor to look after them. Meat price went up throughout the century particularly for those farmers who were near enough to supply the growing London market and sheep were a great value both for their meat and for their wool. The pace of enclosure was dictated by the flourishing state of the export trade in wool and woolen cloth which by 1600 accounted for over 80% of all English exports. English wool was of fine quality and a growing European demand for it sent the price moving upwards from as early as 1450, well before grain prices stated to rise. This was an incentive to landowners to enclose their estates and turn them over to sheep, particularly as enclosure made possible careful breeding to produce bigger and hardier animals. One 16th century Norfolk landowners, for instance, owned more than 15,000 animals. But the ordinary peasant working in the open fields would usually have one or two sheep which he put out to graze on the common pasture. Even when a landlord did not enclose, he would often increase the number of sheep he kept on the common and gradually squeeze out the poorer men. Complaints against this practice were at least as frequent as those against enclosure and the Norfolk peasants who joined Kate's rebellion were primarily concerned to put an end to overstocking the commons. In the early 16th century, large quantities of raw wool were exported mainly by the company of the staple which had a virtual monopoly. The English cloth industry, however, was rapidly expanding and wool exports declined as those of woolen clothes mounted. At the beginning of Henry VIII's reign, about 80,000 pieces of cloth were exported every year, but by the time of Henry died, the figure was nearer 120,000. The demand for cloth was apparently limitless, and more and more landowners went over to pasture farming. But in 1551, the foreign market collapsed and prices fell steeply. This did not halt the process of enclosure, but it showed it down, and even though wool prices slowly climbed, again they did keep pace, this time with the price of wheat 
By 1600, it was more profitable to grow grain than to rear sheep and the conversion of arable to pasture was effectively checked. The wool merchant was widely blamed for the enclosures, causing much unrest. Sir Thomas More spoke of sheep devouring men and also in the writing of John Hill's titled Discourse of the Common Will of This Realm of England, written in 1549, the situation was reflected. Enclosure was largely confined to the middle counties where the soil was suitable for pasture and in Leicestershire, for instance, more than a third of the village were affected by it. Yet although enclosure took place on a big scale and pamphleteers attacked it as a social cancer, it did not bring about the total transformation that might have been expected. Northampton Shire, to take one example, was well suited for sheep farming but in 1712 it was described as mainly unenclosed and over half its area was open when enclosure commissioners of the late 18th century set to work. Tudor enclosures obviously shocked the national conscience far more than actual amount that took place would seem to warrant. One reason for this was widespread but inaccurate assumption that enclosure was always and inevitably accompanied by engrossing the throwing together of two or more farms so that they could be treated as a single unit. When this did happen, some of the buildings that were no longer required would be left to decay and there were instances of whole villages being treated in this way so that they vanished altogether. Yet although the outery against depopulating enclosures was particularly loud in the 1540s, they were by this date extremely rare. The heyday of the evicting landlord had been the late 15th century when labor was in short supply but prejudice against enclosures died hard and the term was used in a general way to describe any action that led to agrarian discontent. Tudor governments were sensitive to symptoms of unrest and tried to check depopulation and enclosures in general. They valued the peasant as a taxpayer and potential soldier and they were afraid that enclosure for sheep would so reduce the area available for corn growing that England would become dependent for food supplies on the goodwill of other powers. Between 1489 and 1597, 11 acts were passed against depopulation and 8 royal commissions, the last of them appointed in 1636, were instructed to investigate the rate and consequences of agrarian change. The number of acts and commissions shows how determined the government was, but it also demonstrates its ineffectiveness. Landlords were too powerful to be easily coerced, particularly when, as justices of the peace, they were the people responsible for enforcing the government's order. The legislation has seldom been effective in holding back economic change. Peasant cultivators were not absolutely powerless when confronted by an improving landlord. Freeholders could claim the protection of the common law courts if their tenure was threatened, but they were usually in a minority. Most of the inhabitants of a manor were copyholders, men who had a copy of the manorial court roll recording the terms of their leases, which were usually for one or more lives. Copyholders could appeal to the court of chancery or star chamber for protection, but they were often ignorant men not conversant with the technicalities of the law who could be browbeaten by an unscrupulous landlord. 
even when legal action was taken it was not always immediately effective the inhabitants of the northamptonshire village of thingden had to flight their lord john mulsho in star chamber and other courts for 40 years from 1498 to 1538 Not surprisingly they often despaired and were goaded into direct action hardly a year passed without reports of riotous assemblies to throw down enclosures and humanities like Moor Lapset Starkey and Hells put forward proposals to check evicting landlords but thomas cromwell was too busy with the dissolution and fell from power before he could accomplish anything their chance came with somerset who revived the court of requests for poor men which met under his own eye in somerset house at hill's suggestion somerset persuaded parliament to pass an act in march 1549 imposing a poll tax on sheep the idea of this was that farmers would hardly convert their land from arable to pasture if in so doing they laid themselves open to heavy taxation this act which caused widespread resentment among farmers and wool merchants marks the climax of the attempt to hold back agrarian change by legislation and it failed present unrest against the activities of landlords in norfolk burst out in kate's rebellion which brought down somerset the peasant's champion and replaced him with northumberland northumberland was more sympathetic to sheep owner than to peasant cultivators and quickly secured the repeal of the poll tax an act passed by his second parliament made it an offence for anyone to convert to pasture land that had been under the plow since 1509 and prosecution of enclosures continued though at a declining rate The significance of Somerset's fall is that it coincided with the collapse of the overseas market for English cloth and it was this which succeeded where government action had failed and checked the spread of enclosures for sheep this then was enclosing the great evil so contemporaries claimed of the first half of the Tudor century the total area affected by one form of enclosure or another was not large though it is hard to give figures perhaps 30% of the arable in an enclosing county or some 3% or 4% of its whole area could be a generous estimate one need only remember that great enclosing movement of the 18th century to get things into proportion hedges were raised and ditches dug in the 16th century now to mark up some strips of open field thrown together by a peasant on the make then again to distinguish the sheep run or horse the park or the big arable farm of a greater landlord or leasehold tenant or perhaps to prevent the villagers from driving their cattle on the common where a speculator grazed his sheep but much of the greater part of the open fields remained open for another two centuries yet the effect of enclosure movement cannot fairly be measured by extent alone Not only was it or rather the outrage against it a political factor of some magnitude but it also embodied a very deep going change in rural economy This is the end of our today's discussion please subscribe to this channel like our video and comment listen to our podcast episode follow our official facebook page twitter handle and instagram For any query feel free to mail us for details see the description